Yo, what is going down, everybody? Welcome to Show Me the Meaning Wisecracks Movie Podcast. Show me the meaning! I am Austin Hayden, and I'm joined by the Show Me the Meaning crew. We have Raymond. Hey, everybody. How's it going? And we've got Michael back with us. Hey, what's up? Two in a row. Apologies, everyone. (laughs) (laughs) And this week we're going to be talking about the 2011, I guess we can call it a cult classic, right? Attack the Block. There's been a recent announcement that finally, after 10 years, the sequel that has been long awaited is in development, apparently. It will be helmed by Joe Cornish, the original writer and director, and it will star the original star that launched this star's career into the fucking stratosphere that's called alliteration friends uh john boyega who you all know from star wars and disney fame now and uh yeah this is kind of the film that put him on the map when he was uh, a young actor in london and so they're going to be doing a sequel so we were like well shoot why don't we jump into the original it is a great film filled with all kinds of rich themes and I'm sure we'll peel some of those things back, but it's also just a really cool, slick sci-fi and a great directorial debut from Joe Cornish as well. So we can talk about all those things. So we'll get there. It also has Jodie Whittaker in it and Nick Frost makes an appearance, which um, I totally forgot that he was in in this film. And um, a bunch of kind of unknown, non-professional actors playing um, the rest of the teenage gang that is helmed by- Great cast all around. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So we'll get into that. But before before we do first impressions, I do want to kick it over to Michael because Michael has a little announcement about some other wisecrack stuff that we got to plug here. So, Michael, oh, what's this up? This is huge, huge news, everyone. Um, if you like this podcast, there's a chance that you also watch a show called Rick and Morty. There's also a chance that you previously listened to the Wisecrack podcast, The Squanch, where we yep. break down every episode of Rick and Morty. And want to let everyone know The Squanch is back. We actually already recorded a preview episode um, with me. Ryan Haley, that you definitely know if you watch this, and Tommy Cook. So you can check that out right now. It's on all the streaming platforms and YouTube. And we will be uh, starting uh, the season this Sunday, June 20th. And right after the first episode of Rick and Morty airs on East Coast time, we're going to go live. So we'll be there. We got uh, It's going to be me, Ryan Haley, and a rotating cast of geniuses this season. But it'll be fun. <laughs> Yeah, that sounds good. That sounds actually more than good. I'm actually looking, looking forward, forward to, to that. It. Yeah. 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 All right. Okay. So you know the deal. This is how we basically start off every episode. We go around, we get first impressions. Now, Michael and I were just talking off air and we were like, oh, shoot, all we really remembered was that we enjoyed this film, but we don't really remember what we enjoyed about this film. So let's talk about first impressions. What was it like the first time we saw it, if we can remember it, even if it's just some sort of sense impression? And then what was it like revisiting this film? And let's start with Michael. Michael, so what was it like the first time that you watched Attack the Block? You know, sometimes like you could go to a restaurant or something like that and you enjoy it. And then five years later, you're like, I'll go back there. But if I were to say, like, what dish did you like? What did it taste like? You would have nothing. But you would say, I just remember that I liked it. Sadly, that's me in this movie. I think um, (laughs) I saw it in theaters. Um, I saw it at a time where we're like Austin. I was living in the United Kingdom, which always adds a little bit of extra flavor when you're Mm -hmm. watching a sort of lower budget UK film four thing. I remember liking it a lot. I remember thinking that Boyega ripped. Obviously, uh, watching uh, other British shows, I was a big big fan of Nick Frost and Jodie Whittaker. Um, But I remembered liking it, not a lot else. Going back into it, um, I was surprised that I, A, still liked it a lot. And I think I uh, appreciated a lot of what the film was trying to say in Mm. ways that I'm not sure that I would have in 2011. Um, And I think... I I found the context of the movie a lot more interesting and I was even thinking about it in comparison to like get out and some other films that kind of explore ideas of, of race along with horror and sci-fi elements. Um, But liked it a lot, made me more excited that a new one's coming out. And I definitely all, all in on this movie. If you haven't seen it, you should watch it. Um, Not sure what we're all going to think, not sure what we'll discuss exactly, but, but enjoyed it. Would go back to the restaurant. (laughs) (laughs) All right, Raymond, what about you? Uh, I really love this movie. Um, maybe maybe similar to Michael, uh, I, I probably had a better recollection of the first time that I saw it. Uh, I really enjoyed it the first time around, but it wasn't until I watched it a second time a few years after that I remember thinking like, no, this is a great fucking movie. Um, it's, it, it's, so, it's so sharp, so well written. It, it, it moves like a freight train. And 
when I was uh, watching it again this morning, mm. I've seen it, you know, two or three times uh, since the first time I've watched it. And so I thought I'll put on one of the there are three commentaries on this Blu-ray. It's totally stacked. I would I would check it out if you're a big fan of this movie. But I put on one of the commentaries. Uh, it's a, a really great conversation between Joe Cornish and Edgar Wright. And I was thinking to myself, I know this movie well enough. I could probably do a podcast about it without rewatching it. So let me just listen to what they have to say. And I was kind of stricken in a weird way that like with the the uh, soundtrack for the movie dipped down so they could do the commentary track. I was kind of amazed as I was watching it because it's it, it is the rare contemporary film that this this is I, I think something of a metric of success with a, a screenplay is that you can tell exactly what is happening in this movie, who these characters are, what they want, what they're trying to accomplish, what the relationship dynamics are to each other. Like you can turn the volume down and you get absolutely everything about this. It's mm. not only not only great snappy dialogue, but it doesn't even need that. It's it's such great visual storytelling. You you yeah. know who these kids are from from the moment they show up and they look like trouble and then throughout the rest of the movie as you know the the hoods and the bandanas and all the layers that as all that stuff starts to come off and you realize like these are just kids you know like they're <laughs> they're just out there getting into trouble making mistakes and just as i was thinking that they say on the commentary that one one of the things um joe cornish mentioned was that he thinks, or maybe it was Edgar Wright brought this up, that if these kids were 18 years old, if they were all only two or three years older, the movie wouldn't work at all. You'd hate them because they have they, they would they would mm. bear such a, a greater burden of responsibility for their actions at the beginning of the film. But they they just thread this needle so beautifully in this film. It's so well cast. It's so well written uh, and very, very wonderfully staged. I give it two thumbs up. I think it's a phenomenal movie. Yeah, I'm there's that. There's the one it. scene where Moses, uh, where Samantha is going through Moses's apartment, and she's like, you know, who lives here? And yeah, Uncle right. comes and goes, blah blah blah. And then she's like, how old are you? And he's like, fifteen. Mm -hmm. And you're like, oh shit, okay. And he's probably the oldest of the gang, right? Or at least he's the most mature. There might be one or two of the others that are, but like, like Pest looks like he's like thirteen, <laughs> you know. Yeah. And that moment's so cool because when when you know she says. He's 15 and she's like, you look older. And he's like, thank you. Thank you. And it's a way where he's yeah. like, yeah, I want to be old. I want to be whatever. That's right. But she says it with this tone of like, oh, shit, like you're a kid. Like I've been looking yeah. at you as, you know, because there's a scene early on. I shouldn't get too much ahead of it where Jodie Whittaker and her neighbor call the kids like fucking monsters. And we have this. early in the film Whittaker agreeing with that at the end, her just being like, man, you're just a kid. And that that reversal mm -hmm. of the way in which she perceives them. Oh, God. But I'm getting ahead of it. Sorry. That's OK. Um. Yeah, so my first impression, again, I actually, very similar to Michael, I didn't really remember, I just remember this is one of those films that over the years when people are like, when it comes up or when they mention John Boyega, I'm like, oh, did you ever see Attack the Block? I'm like, you gotta see Attack the Block. But I couldn't ever explain why. And they'd be like, why? And I was like, oh, it's, you know, it's like, it, it takes place in South London and it's like these like uh, hoodlum kids and they save the, they save the neighborhood from aliens. And they're like, okay. And I'm like, no, no, no. But I'm like, it's it's so much more than that. And it's really good. And it's it's really fast. And it's fresh and all this stuff. So for me, it was always something that it was, it left an indelible mark, but I couldn't exactly describe what it was, at least at the level of content. And I actually think that's okay because reviewing, revisiting this film, like, yes, there's social commentary and there's things like that that we're, I'm sure we're going to delve into. After all, the title of this podcast is Show Me the Meaning, not let's just talk about whether or not we like this film. Um, so I'm sure we'll get into that. <laughs> That'd be a cool title, but, too. But when... <laughs> Um, but the thing whether that struck or not we me like this anything, film <laughs> <laughs> the thing that struck me more than anything was the energy of this film this film just has an energy it gets in it gets out there is zero exposition about the aliens and their intention i mean there's the one bit about the moth i guess that you get at the end with the one guy the stoner dude that's sitting there watching the the science show but even that it's not really exposition about who the aliens are and what they're doing. I mean, there's a little bit of speculation, I guess, but they don't know. There isn't like government officials like we're under siege, you know, lock yourselves down, citizens. We have a plan. We're yeah. coming we, to the... There's oh, none ahead. of that. It's literally just like this small, intimate, immersive um, story about what would happen in this area if some shit 
went down and you just get these teenagers who are at first deemed to be the monsters, but then who encounter real monsters who then become the heroes, right? And um, they're... No, no, yeah, and so it's just this really kind of I, – I read this one little review, and I won't say too much about it. We can talk about it on the other side of the synopsis, where it was well, it was more like a think piece, where they were saying that what Joe Cornish does is he just totally saturates us in the world – uh, in a world that is unfamiliar probably to not only international audiences, but probably even to British audiences. The slang, the language, and there's no explanation of what those terms mean. They just are used over and over and over and over and over again. And by the end, you kind of, you're like, oh, okay, I get it now. It's like, um, it's like Rosetta Stone, the language program that just kind of is immersive, that just throws you into it, but it doesn't like translate it for you. And it's like traveling through a foreign world. And that I really love about it. You're just thrown into this city or into this block within this suburb within this or within this part of the city and um it's it it's doesn't have any sort of like meta commentary outside of it so all the social commentary that we're deriving from it is something that is just experientially derived from these people so yeah what were you gonna say raymond oh i was just gonna say on that on that note um joe cornish on the uh behind the scenes feature uh on the um uh, on the blu-ray he's talking to one of the kids i think the the kid that plays uh probs and uh, the kid asks him, where'd you get the idea for this movie? And Joe Cornish says, uh, have you seen the movie Signs with Mel Gibson and all the aliens and stuff? And the kid goes, yeah. He goes, well, I saw that movie. I really liked it, but I wanted to see what would happen if that movie happened to a, uh, a, a, a housing block uh, where I live <laughs> instead of out in a cornfield in the middle of nowhere. And he's going mm. on and on and he says, and the thing that really got to me about that, the thing that really excited me about the idea, and this was sort of what sparked uh uh, this recollection for me, Austin, that you you sort of alluded to the fact that these are not the kids you anticipate to be the heroes of a movie like this. And he mm -hmm. said, you know, I really liked the idea that all these kids that uh, people look down on or people are afraid of or that they, they don't take the time to try and understand if something really bad like this happened, they'd be the first ones on the front lines because they're, <laughs> you know, right. they 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 are are the first people in like the classic '80s movie fashion. The kids are always the one to understand the premise of the movie before anybody else, <laughs> and they're they're the ones with the like the vim and vigor to go do something about it. So, I uh, I I like this movie a lot. All right, so the last thing that I'll say, and then we'll just do a quick little recap of the film, is I also heard that um, Joe Cornish was himself mugged in South London by a I group that, of yeah. teens. And so uh, it was this film kind of fell out of his imagination. Once he said he started to realize that these teens had a much richer inner life and social life than they're typically given credit for in the act of just being mugged. And he yeah. was like, okay. So I think there's something really interesting. And in, I guess there's an act of empathy there that mm -hmm. yeah. maybe kind of explains why this film is so immersive and gives us just a tour through a foreign land. So anyway, I love this film. Um, and I'm glad that I loved it because I hate when you revisit a film and you loved it and you're like, oh man, it, I didn't love it. And then you Falls ruined apart. the great... Yeah. The great viewing yeah. experience that you had the first time around. But so I love it. Okay, here we go. We'll do a quick recap and, uh, and then we'll start peeling things back. So it's Guy Fox night and trainee nurse Samantha Adams is mugged by a gang of teens in South London. When something falls from the sky and crushes a nearby car, Samantha escapes. The leader of this little gang, Moses, checks out the crash site, hoping to find some valuables in the car, but an unfamiliar creature begins to attack him, scratch his face, and then runs away. The teens end up tracking the creature down and killing it. They take it to local drug dealer Hi Hats in hopes that they can find a way to make some money and maybe some fame from killing this thing, selling it, whatever. And soon they learn that this creature is actually an alien, and then more and more objects begin falling from the sky, and they start to realize that it's a type of invasion. So the gang load up on some weapons and go to try to take more of these aliens out. But these new ones are much bigger and scarier, so it's going to take a lot more than just beating it with a bat. Meanwhile, Samantha accompanies the police so that she can identify the muggers. They end up finding Moses and the gang, and Moses gets arrested. But while he's in the police van, an alien attacks the cops, which then lets Dennis, one of the other gang members, drive the van to safety. So with Samantha still in the van, but Samantha ends up fleeing, and the rest of the gang try to get to Wyndham Tower. And then Pest, one of the other gang members, he ends up getting bitten. And then they find out that Samantha lives in their building. But because they know that she's a nurse trainee, they get her to treat his injured leg. And then Samantha ends up deciding to join them to take down the aliens. 
Now, later they learn that the aliens are somehow attracted to Moses because of a little mark that has been placed on his jacket and that they're going to keep coming after him and the gang. So they decide to form a plan to stop the aliens once and for all. Moses lures all the aliens into one apartment that's filled with gas, lights off some fireworks, and causes a massive explosion while he leaps to safety out of a window. Explosion kills all the aliens and leaves a huge portion of the building in flames. Afterwards, the cops come and arrest Moses and the surviving members of the gang, assuming them to be responsible for the deaths in the neighborhood and the damage caused. Samantha corrects the story, but they're still arrested, and they're thrown into the back of a police van where they can hear the residents of the block cheering for Moses. All right, before we continue, I got to give a shout out to our sponsor of this week's episode, Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community where you can connect with other like-minded people and creatives and where you can explore projects that you are passionate about. This is why Skillshare is so cool because you can unleash your creativity and you can pursue your passions right from the convenience of your own home. They offer thousands and thousands of classes for creative and curious people such as yourselves on topics like indie filmmaking, I iPhone photography, editing, drone filming, classes on improving productivity, which I'll be honest, I need right now. I'm still in a little bit of a rut, so I need a little bit of a kick in the butt. So any anything that can motivate me, that that I'll take it. <laughs> um, how to make videos for Instagram is another class that you can take. Things that the, on the intersection of art and activism, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So if you want to explore your creativity and connect with some cool people to help motivate you, if you're in a rut like myself, get on one of those forums and maybe you can find some cool people so you can help collaborate together. Go check out Skillshare. Go to Skillshare.com slash SMTM. That's Skillshare.com slash SMTM, and you'll get a free trial of their premium membership. So to get a free trial of the premium membership, go to Skillshare.com slash SMTM, or of course, there will be a link down below in the show notes. All right, now let's start peeling apart Attack the Block. Um, So the last thing I said, I guess, at the end of First Impressions was that this was inspired by when Joe Cornish himself was mugged. So what do we think about that experience? Like, why is this film so immersive? Do you think there's something about empathy? Do you think, rather than him being on a soapbox trying to give us a a film that is social commentary or that is a film about South London from the, the view of an outsider, like, do you think there's something about his experience that makes this film immersive or is there just something else like why is this film so successful as like an immersive trip through a foreign territory well i think there is something really beautiful that uh is sort of revealed by that story think of how many folks would go through that experience and have a really a really negative or reactionary response to it um and they would they would think of that experience as just an isolated incident and they would you know make all kinds of prescriptions about that person uh, who had tried to mug them or whatever. And to come away from that and and like interrogate that experience and try to see it from the other person's eyes and recognize that, you know, mm-hmm. nobody nobody endangers other people or potentially endangers themselves. Well, I won't say nobody, um, but it, it's very <laughs> unlikely that someone would commit petty crime without uh, without some degree of necessity or something like that. And to come away from that and create something that is like really... In, in some ways, you know, I don't want to get too schmaltzy about it, but it is very, very touching. And, and like you said, there's the, mm. this this movie kind of oozes empathy and understanding. And it, he does what uh, what great actors always do, which is they they never judge the characters that they're playing. And I, I think it's it's pretty fair to say he never mm. judges any of the characters he's writing. But uh, Michael, what do you got? Well, I think it's like interesting. Uh, and this is, you know, there's like the uh, thing we get in a lot of films is this. uh kind of Aristotelian reversal of recognition thing where there's a character and they think one way or they perceive the world in one way and something happens and wow, they now see it differently. Something's happened where they're on the (laughs) other side of that. It's great. Um, I think this film opens in a way that it has a similar effect on us, the viewer, because we watch the movie and we see Jodie Whittaker getting out of the, the tube station and we think, oh, this is a a, a, um, a pretty woman. She's probably the main person in the movie. And Jodie Whittaker at that point had been on some TV shows in the UK, I think had more of a like star standing than many of the, the boys. And when we see these these boys show up with masks on, one might assume 
she is is the protagonist she is the character we should be empathizing with these are the mm. the boys that are bothering her but after the attempted burglary she runs and we stay with them and the film kind of forces us to be mm. with those kids and we slowly find ourselves going from like that's so horrible how could they do that to building empathy for a perspective that we maybe thought was going to be like the antagonistic force in the film and i like what that does in disrupting expectations right off the bat and I think it opens up the viewer to the perspective of those kids in a way they might normally not be open to. Yeah, that's a great cinematic trick just to kind of piggyback on that. It's almost like we, the audience, um, let's say a standard British viewing audience are Jodie Whittaker. And we're the ones who are afraid to walk through the block late at night. And we see the kids and we try to do the thing where we try to cross the street, but we don't get away. And then we 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 get mugged, and um, yeah, we do get her back at the police station, but not until we've already then started to be like, oh wait a second, we're gonna learn something about these kids in this extraordinary situation that they're thrown into, right? And that is really interesting. It's almost like, hey, you the audience, you're the one taking a journey through this neighborhood, but guess what? You can't leave. You know, <laughs> you can't get out so quickly, and then. Um, and then somehow try to explain it away or, like Raymond was saying, form some sort of potential reactionary opinion on the events that happened. That is really interesting. I, I guess I hadn't... So what... Um, without without trying to be like, okay, what is this film saying? Um, what is this film saying? <laughs> um, well, what, this is what, what I'm confused we... about, so I'm curious what yeah. everyone thinks. Yeah. So like, do we think the film is saying something or do you think it's more just presenting something and then we're able to kind of be like, oh, okay, this is actually a mirror held up to us and it makes us feel something by kind of venturing into this foreign land and then being like, okay, well now maybe I can reformulate some opinions, which is nice because it isn't preachy, but rather it's just, it's just one holding up a mirror, maybe in the form of Jodie Whittaker, who is the character that has the big arc, right? She's the one that kind of starts. Whereas, I mean, I guess... Does Boyega have an arc? I would say, I would is, say Moses does. Yeah. yeah. Is it is it maturity? Is it learning to kind of... Is it like acceptance of consequences? In, in, in that, and this is a, a thing I'm kind of curious to talk with you all about because I, I worry yeah. about this interpretation in one sense because it's a little maybe too moralistic and interpretation coming from me, not the filmmakers. But, you know, yeah. Boyega goes through this thing where like initially we see him mug someone. Then an animal at that point he thinks hurts him and he thinks it's a dog. This dude is like, I'm going to fuck the dog up. I'm going to take my friend and we're going to fuck up this animal, <laughs> yeah. right? That's how like gnarly yeah. and and sort of petty he is. And and by the end of it, when he realizes that, you know, mm -hmm. the whatever, the alien ectoplasm on his body, got his friends killed, has, has mm -hmm. hurt people, that he has caused this harm. He takes that responsibility onto himself such that, you know, mm -hmm. if you think he might die and he thinks he might die in protecting the people he loves and protecting his block. Um, now I wonder then in that, and this is what I'm kind of curious about. I hope this isn't jumping ahead, but I read a review that was from like 10 years old from the Atlantic. And the writer of that review had this take that said something like, um, Oh yeah, I have this note down. He said, you know, Moses realizes it was his own reckless actions that brought the creatures and are causing those around him to suffer. Um, the parallels to reality where seemingly meaningless acts of crime bring more brutal law enforcement, increased poverty are blunt but touching. So the first part of that quote from that writer, are like, OK, yeah, Moses accept responsibility for his actions. The second one where the writer and it's the writer Daniel D. Snyder says where acts of crime bring more brutal law enforcement and increased poverty. That's where I was like, ugh, because that feels like blamey. <laughs> Like saying like, you know, and, and I was wondering reading that review, I was like, is that, was that happening in the film? Is this just a kind of reactionary writer projecting that onto it? Well, on on the one hand, uh, the, the first part of that statement, I would say, uh, having just watched the commentary, Joe Cornish even states pretty unequivocally, he goes, I he said in the commentary that he doesn't think the first alien ever would have plummeted out of the sky if Moses hadn't decided to mug somebody. That yeah, yeah, yeah. to him, the, the movie is in a sense about a kind of not necessarily mm. karmic retribution, but there is a karmic balancing that's happening where he is he is learning. So from it's the his opposite mistakes. of save the cat; it's kill the dog. <laughs> yeah, it's kill <laughs> it's, it's kill the alien. Um, <laughs> and and there there is a sense that you get. Uh, he also said that he never wanted 
any of the other kids' deaths or endangerment to be attached to their actions that that he did, like you said, uh, Michael, he, he did need to understand by the end of it that there are consequences and um, maybe even in a broader sense that like doing the right thing is not always easy, but mm-hmm. it's always going to be right. Um, and, you know, it's it's worth it to do the decent thing. I think the second part of that statement may be a little bit problematic, but I mean... I think in in a perfect world, we could read that the second part of that statement exclusively in bad faith where he's he's saying, oh, it it always brings, you know, law enforcement. We live in a very imperfect world where, like, the yeah. truth of the matter is whether or not it should bring more law enforcement. You know, I, I personally uh, believe that it shouldn't. Um, that is quite commonly the you know, that that is the response to crime is uh, further militarization and, and funding of the police. So you're saying like there's a way just you're kind of opting forward to think this is good or a realist take where a take like that is yeah. projected onto a, a granted a i haven't i haven't read the rest of that review maybe the next sentence he says and that's the way it should be <laughs> and i'll have to eat some crow but i, I well the writer I just, is um he's the president of the police union in pittsburgh so <laughs> i don't know if that changes anything no a little movie uh, movie film criticism <laughs> op-ed <from laughs> yeah, <why not>? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah oh what do you think about uh the the sort of moral and 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 aspects of the character's journeys here austin i mean i feel like it's kind of part and parcel of of any sort of western hero tale right is there's always Mm. some sort of lesson that is learned and and even when it's done cleverly there's always some sort of moral tale that is told i think it's kind of we woven into the fabric of of how we tell story and um, if there is the moment where, like, if you read, like, I don't know, John Truby's Anatomy of Story, and he has the, the seven, the seven essential kind of like points that you have to hit. The final two for him are like the final battle, which you obviously get with Moses and the aliens, and it's a great final. Like, that's a great like. But before the final battle even happens, there's a moment of realization, and the moment of realization I wondered as you were talking, Michael, is it's almost like not self-sacrifice. There's two ways that you could look at it. One is it's like, I'm going to be the fucking hero, um, which they did. They do want, they do talk about like fame a bit, you know, wanting notoriety, you know, somehow getting out of the block, maybe, um, even if it's just in their own imagination. And so maybe he's fantasizing with that, but I don't think so. I do think it's much more grounded. I do think it's shit. You know, a, a couple of my friends are dead because of me. And there is a sense in which he's taking responsibility um, and once you start talking about like responsibilization, which is a term that academics like to use now, you already in moralistic territory, right? And so he is taking responsibility and it is a sort of like moral maturity in that to recognize that. Um, and I think that then what he does is he almost does like a Jesus thing where he's like, well, then I'm just going to sacrifice myself. And I think mm-hmm. he kind of does accept his fate so to speak, which again is kind of like a tragic acceptance, right? So there's some classic storytelling points that I think are really being covered here with the hero myth, with the acceptance of responsibility, with a moral tale, and then with the sort of tragic focus. And then what I wonder is, is at the end, for John Truby again, to kind of like go back to that reference that I mentioned, who wrote this book, Anatomy of Story, he's a famous script doctor. Um, The whole idea is, is that now the protagonist can never go back to the world that it once knew before because it's learned. You know, it's confronted at his or her own moral failings and then the social failings of society. The world is now changed and he or she, in this instance, he is now changed and he can never go back. So that's what I wonder is, is, is there some sort of change or is it really more just that the world has changed? Like, has he changed in the sense that he's matured and he realizes, okay, I can't engage in petty crime anymore and I can't do that? Like, like somehow is he like like mad at himself for his previous hoodlum ways and he's like judging himself? I don't know that that's the case because I don't think that this film is taking a stance on this is why you shouldn't be involved in petty crime if you yeah. are on the lower socioeconomic spectrum, right? So I don't think it's that. It's something else yeah. and I'm not exactly sure what it is. But there's well, something that he's learned, but it's not yeah. like... It's not like a. It's not like we don't judge who he was at the beginning of the film so much. Well, I think there's that a, a way sense. in which like parts yeah. of who he was at the beginning of the film that we didn't see are revealed. I think there's this scene when they're in the the weed room, and I don't know if it's Moses or one of the other guys that says to the the Jody Whitaker um, character Samantha, they they say to her like, Samantha. "If we would have known you lived here, we never would have done that." 
Um, and you <laughs> yeah. see that they have this like this like kind There's of like a civic code. pride in a yeah. way. Yeah. It's yeah. like, oh, like we assumed you were from outside of here. We assumed you weren't like one of us. And it was interesting to yeah. see that there is that little bit of a code. And maybe it's like an extending of that that's happening. But I, I did think it was interesting that it slowly reveals like they already had this kind of code. Maybe it's about them extending that further or, or seeing people oh. from outside the block as as having the uh, the personhood of those from within the block. Yeah, because yeah, remember they're me disappointed of, oh. when they mug her too, and they're like, "Oh, she's a nurse. She's got nothing on her." Well, you know, why are you mugging a nurse? You know, they don't make any money, and it's just a real offhanded remark as they're walking away. But yeah, they're and then they find out that she's not even a nurse. She just grad. She's a trainee. Yeah. She like just graduated. So um, yeah, there is. It is interesting that there is a code about how. They're all in this together kind of thing, you know? What were you going to say, Raymond? Oh, I was just going to say, um, apropos of what, uh, what Michael was saying about the, like, attachment to this place more than anything as, like, its own type of character. It just kind of reminded mm -hmm. me of, uh, I don't know if y'all have seen the documentary about Cory Booker from, like, a decade ago. I think it's called Street Fight. And mm -mm. there's a, a scene in which he's holding kind of like a, a town hall at the apartment uh, the 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 apartment block or where, wherever he lives and all these people who have the opportunity to go and like ask him questions about policy and you know his platform and everything all they want to know is like do you actually live here mm -hmm. <laughs> and he, and he keeps <laughs> saying like you can go to my apartment you can go into my house right now and see dirty dishes in the sink and blah 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 but it is one of those things that it it it, it weirdly does kind of uh come to the foreground in this movie, a movie that I think is uh, in a certain way very, very much about class um, and how uh, these the, the, the gang of kids are perceived to be a certain class by how they present at the very beginning of the movie. Samantha, in much the same way, is perceived to be of a certain class that she not necessarily is because she's, she's a nurse. Oh, she's just a nurse trainee. Oh, she lives here like she's one of us. And there is, there is this kind of subtle commentary about um, the, the, the distinction of class and, and how that uh, creates a certain unity or solidarity. Let's, yeah. let's kind of Let's get deep into potentially one of the themes relating to class, race, um, social exclusion, etc. Here's a quote from Moses. It's probably like the quote that is the most heavy handed quote in the film. He's sitting in the apartment after um, after the chaos this is in the middle of, of the madness. And he says, government probably bred those things to kill black boys. First, they sent in drugs. Then they sent guns, and now they're sending in monsters to kill us. They don't care, man. We ain't killing each other fast enough, so they decided to speed up the process. Do you think that these aliens are a metaphor? Do you think that this is just... Uh, again, what I, what I, when I first watched it, I was like, oh, this is just his perspective, which is so lovely because, again, it isn't like government officials are saying, we don't know where these aliens come from. We don't understand their intention. And this is kind of, this is how it is. Remember remember when Kyrie Irving said that the earth was flat and everyone yes. was, or he said that he didn't know and everyone kind of freaked out. And then in the interview later, he's like, look, man, he's like, I'm from a neighborhood where we just don't trust authority figures just because they say something. I've been, I've been misled too many times, right? By people to just say, this yeah. is how things are. This is how things are. Why am I just supposed to trust people? He's like, I don't know. Uh, he's like, he's like, it could be. And I, and I thought that was actually a really kind of poignant remark. And I feel like this is something similar. This is kind of him saying, look, man, from my perspective, this is how things are. They've tried all this shit constantly. In my experience, this is probably the feds, as they keep saying, um, just throwing something into our neighborhood to kill us faster because we're not doing it fast enough. So what do we think about this quote? Um, what does it mean? What's it saying? It, it's, it's it kind, uh, kind of reminds me of, um, I think it was a click hole blurb that said something like, uh, Q QAnon is uh, a conspiracy theory that holds that uh, powerful elites are secretly evil instead of outwardly and openly evil, <laughs> <laughs> and it does it does kind of dovetail nicely with that this yeah. this notion that like, well, yeah, I mean, what is what is the apply Occam's razor to this thing, and what is more likely that our first interaction or our first known interaction with an alien life form would just hurdle out of the sky and land on our block or that 
you know, mm-hmm. uh, uh, marginalized communities would uh, continue to be oppressed and purposefully marginalized by uh, a, a relentless and, and uncaring government. Um, Michael, I, I know that you are uh, the resident NBA enthusiast. I, I wonder if you have any uh, anything to say about the... Uh, I remember Kyrie kind of recanting as well, saying that he he was like, look, I just went down a really bad YouTube wormhole. Yeah. <laughs> I, can't, I, think, I think he kind of... He notched it up to experience in the end. But yeah. uh, what do you got, Michael? Well, we were going to introduce a new segment called the NBA Playoff Moment. So everyone grab your... No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> but I, I don't, don't leave. Um, I mean, yeah, I think that the Kyrie example... I think interesting in that way because he later was just kind of like, I don't know, like I saw some stuff. I was just asking some questions. I don't know. Like there's something mm-hmm. about it that if we're really, really generous is like the Socratic, like know what you don't know. And and Kyrie was sure. just sort of like, listen, I don't know that. Like I haven't been in space. I don't have this sort of knowledge. I'm not just going to assume things. <laughs> that's right. Um, so, you know, it's kind of fun. But I, I, on the example and that great quote, I'm so glad you brought that one up, Austin. Um, I feel like there's like these two perspectives of that, right? So you have Moses who's like, Of course, this shit is happening. Of course, after everything Mm -hmm. we deal with in this community, life life gets even harder for us with with fucking Mm. aliens from the sky with blue teeth and, and, you know, non-reflective black fur or whatever. (laughs) On the flip Mm -hmm. side, it's just another example of something that the police officers or whoever arresting them will never believe and will never understand. And it makes me think of like there's some points. um, I forget which season. There's a few parts in like The Wire. Where, where what makes the show so brutal is you see how horrifically hard, like especially I think season two or season three with the kids, you see how hard their lives are. And then how from the perspective of like a cop or a teacher, sometimes it's like, well, work harder. Well, you know, you got to do this different. But it's like, no, 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 no. You don't get it. And there's that final scene, of course, where like he's, he's getting arrested. All the aliens are dead. So there's no like evidence, really. No one's going to believe any yeah. of these people. And yeah. that's why I brought it up before. It reminds me of the um alternate ending of get out which is one of the most fucked up things ever oh it's gut turning yeah. yeah so we we all know in get out at the end Lil rel shows up saves the day the tsa doesn't mess around um i think chris the protagonist mm-hmm. gets away okay one of the original endings which they they changed uh he gets arrested and goes to jail and no one believes him because why would anything that that the car- protagonist mm-hmm. of get out why, why, why would a story ever be true? Yeah, well, someone was going to take your brain and put it in someone else's head. Okay. And in the same way, you're left in this film and you were talking about, like, you know, the, the ending of it, Austin, that's sort of like the tragic element. I mean, I don't know what's going to happen. Probably not good. I guess we'll find out in this new version. But I do think there is a, a realism there and that reminder that no matter how hard it is for Moses and his friends, most people in authority are never going to see that. And then, of course, in the Samantha character, we see someone that has that journey from beginning of the film y'all are fucking monsters by the end she's sticking up for him you know with authority figures Mm. it is kind of perfect that it's 10 years later because i wonder if he's been in juvenile because he's 15 years old so now if he's mid-20s and maybe he's been in juvenile i don't know what the plot is um but maybe he's been in juvenile pick up like post incarceration that's right go a thousand different i'm really excited because because if the cops do hold him responsible and obviously this is total speculation for people listening but if the cops do um uh if he is arrested he wouldn't be tried as an adult he's 15 years old is 16 because i know 16's age of consent in the uk is 16 when they would is that like legal? If you're British, let us know. Is if that you're when a British in the comments, teenager Dumbo? who commits crimes? Let us know. <laughs> when you, yeah, we, when do you, when do you freak out? For you me, when we were committing petty them, crimes, eighteen name. was the age yeah. when I was like, oh, no longer can we uh, can we go do stupid <laughs> shit. But if for you, well, if it's sixteen, is, let us know. Even if he is, you know, tried as an adult, uh, who who knows? Is the sentence for blowing up an apartment 10 years? <laughs> like, what is the, is it disturbing yeah. of the peace? Will they make some joke about how it's just a slap on the wrist despite being, like, immensely devastating? Yeah. Um, <laughs> no, I think that uh, kind of what y'all were talking about before about how no one is going to believe this kid, it, it does come back to this thing just to, just to sort of, like, sidetrack to an aesthetic uh, kind of conversation really quickly. I think there are a lot of movies, especially in recent years, especially in genre, um, where the, the 80s thing has been so done to death and everyone is trying to like, whether it's, you know, the John Carpenter fonts for their title cards or the synth heavy scores mm. or just straight up 80s nostalgia with uh, all the fetishization of the wardrobes and stuff like that. In none of those movies or TV shows 
do the 80s vibe as well as this movie does with, it, for example, law enforcement being this sort of false friend, the way that like when the FBI mm. shows up in Die Hard, they immediately make things much worse. Um, there, there is this this really cool vibe with all of this that you don't you don't see much in movies anymore. Uh, it has like the sort of Gremlins tone and the John Carpenter tone of of mm. of being a movie that Michael you you said before we got on air that uh, because you don't do spooky things very well, but no. you can handle kind of jump scary things here and there. This is a great movie to introduce, not necessarily kids, but it's it, I think a great genre sort of bridge piece that can can help bring you know, younger folks into the conventions or the vernacular of science fiction and horror. And we just don't get a lot of those anymore. So I think it's really special. But sorry, that's my uh, Raymond's aesthetic no, no. corner really quick. We loved it. No, no, this is great because because I do want to talk about the aesthetic too because this film, like I said, it, it, when I was giving my, my first impressions and, and talking about revisiting it, this film to me is more, and I hate, I, I, I just don't have the vocabulary to say it better, but it's more vibey. It's more tony than I was expecting it to be, than anything, you know? It's not style to the neglect of substance or form to the neglect of content. It's actually, it's form in the service of content and vice versa, right? Like there's this wonderful kind of dual relation that it holds and it's the speed. It's got a very Edgar Wright kind of feel to it, how there's just no, there's there's, there's no fat on this at all. What is it, an hour and a half and... Slightly less. 88 like, minutes. Yeah. Eight, like that, if you can, that's, that's a fucking, that's a gift to cinema goers, right? Is like, here, yeah. just have this really tightly packed, you get in, immediately the aliens are there within the first five minutes. Like, there isn't oh, yeah. like a world that's set up. Like, the way that they set up the world is a dark street and a woman walking at night and some teens with masks. And that's the world. And you're like, oh, okay, yeah. I know where we are. Like, yeah, like, there's I like a quick okay. overhead shot of London for like 30 seconds. You're like, cool, let's go. Um, <laughs> yeah, and I, yeah. I do think the soundtrack helps a lot. I think it's Basement Jacks did all the music for it, and, and it keeps you going the whole time. You know, you talked about Raymond like doing the director's cut without the music. Uh, it has to be interesting to see that w w without that or sort without, of like, yeah, without the dialogue. Oh, without with, dialogue. Yeah, sorry, sorry. There's... Yeah, yeah. But I, I was really impressed by how much work the soundtrack does. And another thing that that Edgar Wright um, is very good at doing. Absolutely. Yeah, a, a phenomenal his... visual storyteller, Edgar Wright. I think he's he, what he's was up his there role? with any contemporary filmmaker. Yeah, what was his oh, role? He was in he film? was in the, uh, one of the executive producers, and he also knew Joe Cornish for a decade before mm. uh, he made this. And in in Joe Cornish's own words, he said that Edgar Wright not only is a, a close friend but something of a mentor to him. And okay. um, they, funny enough, Edgar Wright, while working in a, a producer capacity on this, really just kind of helped get the ball rolling on the project because he was at the time finishing up Scott Pilgrim vs. the World. Um, to the point where the two of them had these movies in like neighboring editing suites when they were uh, putting mm -hmm. the final the final touches on them. So they would kind of like work on their movie, then they'd go next door and give each other notes on this, that, and the other. And I do think cool. it is, they, they say it several times in the commentary that 88 minutes, Edgar Wright at one point, he says, it's just with, with no uh, like elucidation whatsoever. He goes, 88 minutes is just the perfect runtime for a first feature. Uh, <laughs> and Joe yeah. Cornish just goes, yeah, I couldn't agree more. <laughs> I just like, never thought about this before too. Isn't it the case that um, Edgar Wright was supposed to uh, either write or direct the first Ant-Man film and then Cornish took over? Yes. No, no, no. Uh, Peyton Reed eventually oh. um, uh, directed that ha film. Has Cornish worked on a Marvel movie or is about to? Or am I making um, this up? I don't know that he has. I know that he's been. I should know this. This is literally my job on this podcast is to know stuff like this. Um, <laughs> oh, but yeah. the the Ant Man saga is uh, sort of a tale of woes. I know that Edgar Wright was working on Ant Man before the MCU was even a thing. Like he had been pushing that boulder uphill forever because that that character means so much to him. And within just a few weeks that he was supposed to go into production on this script he had been developing for like a decade. Oh, they they wrote came a in with draft a draft of, of the screenplay. Oh, okay. Oh, well, he probably co-wrote Edgar Wright's draft. With of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, um, cool. I knew he had something to do sense. with it. Sorry for distracting us with that. No, everyone. it's all good. Um, did, Marvel, did they, Marvel in the commentary, in like did they the talk about him. some of the, ex, 
like the specific choices with regards to why the aliens looked the way they did that they absolutely they, what yeah. can can we talk about that a little bit because that that was a really yeah. cool i i love these fucking I alien love, dog i love things. that like vanta black surface and so, like the only yeah. three-dimensional thing on them is the teeth it's so cool um but he said that it was it was largely inspired by ralph bakshi's lord of the rings adaptation which if you're familiar is a uh, uh, an animation uh, an, uh, uh, an animated adaptation from the 70s, I think it was 79, and uh, the ring wraiths in that are similar, that they would they would film uh, a live action reference and then they would animate over that. And mm. just the way that the ring wraiths are kind mm. of flattened into this really sort of like hyper absorbent 2D sort of silhouettes no matter what kind of light they were in and stuff he just really liked that notion and they talked a lot about uh on the special features they talked a lot about how they achieved that in this movie hmm how did they achieve that in this movie? <laughs> oh well i mean through rotoscoping the same way that ralph Bakshi achieved yeah. it in the 70s cool. and that's one of the really really cool things about this on the very first episode of this show that i ever i ever appeared on i i went on a tangent about how great total recalls uh uh, practical <laughs> effects are and uh they are and this this movie is kind of in i don't necessarily know a similar vein because its effects are being done and deployed in a very different way um but this is just a reminder of how effective simple tricks are that they mm. they had a guy in this sort of like gorilla suit who was chasing these kids yeah. around <laughs> and then in post they essentially just like they just went in and colored over them with just a flat black, you know. And what was so cool is they they said in a lot of the um, a lot of the shots they talk about how they wanted the 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 housing block to essentially be the Nostromo from Alien, where they're in the like very foggy hallways and they're kind of like downlit from those lights above oh, or cool. those yeah, windows yeah. above the doors. And there are some sequences where. Uh, the, the the aliens are kind of coming around corners and you see them backlit through the fog like something straight out of uh, straight out of alien and hmm. he said he was so surprised there were tons of shots like that where they thought well we're gonna have to you know do a, a, a pass on this and post and, and touch up the effects and stuff and he said there were a lot of times when the light just caught it perfectly and they didn't have to retouch it at all and so just cool. yeah it, it just speaks to to the power of what you can do when when there is not only a plan for implementing these effects on the back end in you know in the good old-fashioned practical sense but also having something there for the actors to respond to react to in in, in you know live in front of the cameras it, it you really can't replace it you know no amount of tennis balls can bring that same same effect out mm -hmm. of uh, the performers surrounding it wow real yeah, like let's talk a little bit constraints thing here sorry Austin, i was just like no no yeah no it's, that's keep going well, no, it's just simply saying that it's a real example of like uh, awesome creativity being inspired by constraints, low budget, and them just doing incredible things with it. Cliche thing to point out, but hearing that is just making me like this movie even more than I already did. Yeah, right. Let's talk a little bit about the performances and the actors. Um, as we said at the at the outset of the episode, most of these are, you know, just non-professional local teens or that they brought on board. Yeah. I think John Boyega was an actor, right? But the rest of the cast were not. Is that correct? Or was even he I think a first I read, time? It was a lot of kids from like community theater programs in Bingo. London. So they were like okay. just truly kids from neighborhoods like that, and they were in like youth theater. Yeah, amazing. They, they said uh, pretty much every kid that was interviewed on the special features said that they had an acting teacher or an acting coach or at least a director that had brought them this casting notice because they just did an open call for a lot of these roles. I think they they said they read upwards of 17 or 1800 kids. Wow. I personally really love the two young ones, too, that are like, what, <laughs> so what like nine and six or whatever. And it's so <laughs> cute because you have like these these age differences. You've got Jody, who's what, early 20s. And then you've got uh, the teens who are just barely teenagers, let's say 13 to 15. And then you've got these other kids. And so you get Boyega's kind of maturity. He wants to be older than he looks. He's like very proud of that fact. Um, but then you're also like, but you're just a fucking kid. But then of course they're constantly talking to the kids and they're like, no, you guys are just kids. Like you're too young. And then those kids, they want to be old because they want to be cool like yeah. the, the rest, the other well, kids. Well, then there's the like the gang so leader, weird rapper, weed kingpin guy. 
Hi hats. Hi hats. Sorry, who treats you know Boyega yeah, yeah. and the guys like just little idiots? And was like, he mid? He's like mid twenties probably or sure, something yeah. like that. Yeah, yeah. But so it, there's is, this, it is there, interesting how like the 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 sort of like the wake trail of influence sort of yeah, trickles yeah, exactly. back through the, you know, the age ranges that like these kids do like look up to other kids. It's like the John Mulaney bit about uh, hiring a horse to watch a dog. Or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. And it's really kind of well done how you're kind of given and it's never even really commented on, but you're kind of given a shot into like three generations that are kind of like all living within this, within this place. Um, yeah, so, and yeah. you can see you how think? like some of the more unsavory aspects of what of what some of these kids get involved in become like cyclical and self sustaining. Exactly, it is. I exactly. think a pretty a pretty uh, I would say subtle but conscious critique of uh, a, a lot of like systemic class issues. It's almost like a faded deterministic logic that oh these young six year olds are going to be like hi hats. Right. Eventually they're going to become the teenage uh, uh, gangsters and then they're going to go and then they're they're going to end up like like that's that's where they're Um, going to go. Unless they're unless their intermediary influence being Moses finds a a way to divert from that path to sort of part a Red Sea of of bad influence and take them to, to a land of milk, honey and and I don't know, like uni funding or something. I was going to say fireworks. <laughs> oh, yeah, fireworks. Sorry. Fireworks. Uh, yeah. Okay, so last thing. Let's do this. This is a very simple question, but, like, why does this film work so well? We've all spoken quite highly about this film, and we've talked about the aesthetic, the energy, the kind of interesting social commentary. If we could encapsulate it in just a, a soundbite, like, why does this film work? Who's going first? I'll say something really simple and let you guys say smart stuff. This movie um, builds a clear and specific world upon which it lays a very um simple and executable premise mm. sure i i would which is which I, is great i think because we have so many people who write to us that are like aspiring filmmakers too and i yeah. love what you said that that they that edgar wright and joe cornish in the commentary said 88 minutes is a perfect length for a first <laughs> feature because i've been to so many film festivals and you get these like these these young people i'm gonna say young dudes in particular who have these like three hour epics that are inspired by malik and inspired by cramming Tarkovsky. every idea and influence they've ever had and, <laughs> yeah uh... and i get it and i and i get it like like i i'm loquacious so just imagine if i was making a feature it would be a five hour fucking uh it would be a bellatar film um so like i i get it but there is something lovely about being able to just tighten something up in this really neat package that you can give to people. Yeah. yeah. I also think there is, um, Michael basically took my answer. I think he keeps oh, it no. simple and that's, <laughs> no, no, no. I, I mean, I, I think that's a testament to the the value of, of simplicity a lot of the times, especially in such a, a, a plot driven or genre specific script. But I would also uh, say on top of that is that I kind of touched on this before that he never he never judges the characters he's writing. Yeah. Not only that, but he like he really entrenched himself in, in in a lot of these communities and like would just hang around kids and like listen to the way that they talked. And he you know, he it reminds me of early Spielberg in a way like, you know, some of the great stuff about like E.T. is that the camera is always on the level of the children. The camera mm-hmm. literally never looks down on the children in that movie. Um, and I, I think there's something to that, that he, you know, he put in the effort and it, it comes back to that, uh, that old adage of like, there is, uh, there, there's nothing more universal than the specific, you know, if you yeah. can, mm. if you can really illuminate the inner lives of people, you can't help but be kind of, um, uh, kind of engrossing. Um, and I think, yeah, <laughs> I think well the script, put. yeah, the script is so simple, uh, but also, um, so, so deeply empathetic. It's, it's just great work. That's a perfect way to kind of wrap up the discussion of attack the block. Um, yeah, so definitely check out this film. Uh, it's fantastic. It's fun. It's energetic, and it'll make you think a little too, which is always, I think, a plus when you're talking about a film. So now let's jump into the mailbag. We got an onslaught of voicemails and emails, all wanting to talk about the Bo Burnham Inside episode. So if you want to continue to contribute to conversations about 
inside, you can keep emailing us and uh, calling us about that. Or if you want to talk about Attack the Block or anything else in our back catalog, you can drop us a voicemail at 1-213-534-8807. That's 1-213-534-8807. So I didn't get a name on this uh, voicemail, so we'll just say it's anonymous unless uh, they say it and I just didn't pick up on it, but has um, some thoughts about inside. So let's go ahead and roll that first voicemail. You guys don't hear anything either? I don't hear anything. No. Don't okay. hear it. But is it like a Burnham-esque performance <laughs> voicemail where the silence <laughs> signifies? Oh, here we go. Can you guys hear it at all? No. I can't. Yeah, hear it. it keeps cutting out. Yeah. Sorry, sorry, anyone who's here. We're trying. Yeah, we're uh, little, little techni technical difficulties there. We're, Let's try it. Can we try it one more time? <laughs> this is us trying it one more time. Still can't hear shit. All right, guys. Technology is hard. We're, you know what? Start a podcast. Um, start a podcast. <laughs> Um, have people all around the world hosting at the same time, then try to YouTube the, that live, do that live. Also take voicemails and play to do it. Just do it. Yeah, we've uh, we've been switching some things up. Uh, those of you who are watching live may have noticed we got a fancy new border on the uh, the YouTube page here. So in all of the uh, changes we're making, there have been some technical difficulties. So apologies to the fans. Do you remember what the question was from this particular voicemail? I remember kind of the basic gist of it. We got a handful of voicemails, but I think the one that we were going to um, to talk about on here was uh, something to the effect of um, uh, Bo Burnham's intentionality with the piece. And mm -hmm. we kind of discussed this off mic or off air, excuse me, um, that there there has been a lot of discussion about uh, whether or not this was was too revealing or too unfocused, and um, uh, I don't know, you guys, uh, you guys were steering the ship last week. I couldn't attend, so what do you think? Well, it makes me think of mm. I went and rewatched his earlier specials after talking about Inside. Um, and for anyone who was mad at me because they thought like I didn't like it enough, I think I like it more now. So get less mad at me, please. But um, <laughs> there's a bit I think it's in Make Happy where he knocks a water bottle over <laughs> and acts like it's an accident and then immediately a song plays about how that was all intentional yeah. and you fell for it and yeah. life is a lie yeah <laughs> yeah and, and like yeah and he does that and he there's a thing in both of the specials both in make happy and in what where early on he does something hmm. reveals that you thought it was a trick and it was intentional and that yeah nothing's real so i think like i kind of looked back at inside then with those moments as kind of like the Rosetta Stone um, for interpreting stuff. Mm. And it really made me think of it differently. Yeah. Uh, of how intentional, how specific mm. he is, how everything is a choice. And I think there is uh, a large degree to which I think so many folks have been putting the, the sort of restrictions of this special first in their discussion of it. Like they've taken that context mm. and made it into the content. And I don't necessarily think that's fair because that implies that it was sort of unplanned or spur of the moment. You know, obviously it wasn't planned in the sense that he had been working on this for like two or three years and then uh, just waiting for a pandemic to strike or whatever. But I do think that he was, you know, wrestling with some big ideas. Maybe he doesn't always hit the mark right on the uh, right on the nose. Um, but there is th there is definitely some authorial intent behind it. You know, when, for example, there's that moment I had uh, I had mentioned in our conversation before, Michael, where he's sort of lying on the ground and just free associating about the, the perils of social media. And that's kind of what it comes off as. But then you realize like, oh, the camera is suspended above him in a pretty tricky composition. And he has a very balanced frame with like a set of headphones right here and a mixer right here. It's like... It's pretty good composition. Like you can spiral a golden ratio right <laughs> off of his nose and it encompasses everything. <laughs> you know, there there is that that aspect of it that if you if you engage with the work as a, an intentional piece of art where everything that is inside the frame and outside the frame is either there or not for a reason, I think you, you it, it would open the discussion up a little bit more to the intent rather than just like Oh, the primal scream of it all. You know, I, I for one, think it is uh, something of a natural progression of his onstage persona, um, at least given the circumstances. Mm. Yeah, and I wonder what it says about us 
that we rush so quickly oftentimes to look for that, to try to find the distinction between, oh, is this, is this real? Is this authentic? Or was this staged? What are we looking for in that question? That's what I'm more interested in. And does that somehow invalidate what he's saying? Like if I rehearse the thoughts in my head, but yet I just set up a camera and I'm like, well, I'm just going to record what comes out at a given moment. Uh, is it somehow more authentic because I didn't say, okay, I'm going to sit down in this moment and record it with this screen composition. And maybe in post, he adjusts the frame to make it so that it has that golden ratio <laughs> aspect that you're talking about, right? So, so like, is that more authentic? Or maybe if I'm just sitting there stream of consciousness and I'm like, why is that more supposedly primal in in my expression and why is that something that people would gravitate to not that it shouldn't be i'm not asking that as a rhetorical question i'm asking that seriously like what is it that that elicits that kind of response and i wonder if there's something that people are searching for and they yeah. look for like a voice of authenticity and then when they feel like it's manicured for them it just feels like spin like political spin or social spin and because we're so jaded and spurned by the manicured media stories that were fed all the time that we want somebody to just fucking break out of that and be like, no, you know, like this, this is it. And then so I think if people are expecting that, especially in a commentary that is critiquing that kind of fabricated and manicured media landscape, then we are like, no, but therefore it can't, it can't be rehearsed, right? Like it has to be real. And I'm like, but, but, but what if I sit here in my room late at night and I rehearse thoughts a thousand times in my head, which I've done about what to think about a particular social situation or, or a social artifact? Like, it, am I not rehearsing? Am I not staging? Yeah. Is well, that I think that's something that Burnham's really getting at, right? With like the social media stuff. Um, and I think he says this in his, his special what that like people in the audience view him as a performer, but he's like, we are all performing via social media constantly. And the same moment you're, you're referring to Raymond, where he kind of says like, you know, should we exploit the neurochemical drama of kids? Yeah. So Silicon Valley, uh, Silicon Valley companies can make money. Like everything is tied into this logic of performance and authenticity. And at times it's like performing authenticity Absolutely. Is, is what gets people, yeah. um, you know, the, the, the biggest amount of like cloud or attention. And we don't know anymore. And I think because we don't know, uh, we, we, we want to hold on to something real. And I think if we think something real, if we think it's real and we find out it might not be, it like hurts people's feelings. They feel fooled. And yeah. I think there's some people yes. whose reaction to inside is sort of like, I think they dislike it because they felt so close to feeling something. But then they thought like, mm. who are you to do this to me, Bo <laughs> Who are you to perform this sort of thing? Which then gets, gets back to your point, Austin, like, does that mean it's not authentic? Does that mean he doesn't really think those mm -hmm. things? Does it mean that he hasn't really felt those things? Like if he cries and it's fake on camera, does that negate yeah. the fact that maybe that morning he was also crying? I don't know. That, I don't know the answer. That draws this, into but... question the the authenticity yeah. of any art. I mean, and that's that's a huge conversation. Yes. Like if so, let's get yeah, into let's, that so right now. The second yeah, hour of our program left, begins we'll now. That out. You know, but I think I think there is a degree to which. Some folks, when they when they watch a movie and they get swept up in a moment and they cry along with the characters, like people deep down in their heart, they know that, you know, uh, Natalie Portman isn't really like she's she's affecting an emotional facsimile like for for their own catharsis. And, it, it, you know, it's like that's literally any art. And I, I, I love that he does not feel um at the risk of sounding kind of punny, he doesn't feel confined uh, by the, the the expectations mm -hmm. of the comedy special as a as a genre or as a format. That he he can have those more confessional moments or more authentic moments that you take a step back from and say, okay, but is this Bo Burnham or is this Bo Burnham in scare quotes? You know, like it. Mm -hmm. There there mm -hmm. there is a, a lot of uh, a a lot to chew on. I think uh, in that in that special. So Michael and I. Michael and I used to teach at uh, uh, the same university when we were in grad school together. And do you remember the essay by Lu uh, by Borges called Borges and I that we assigned to? Um, it was the metaphysics class, like Descartes thought in reality yeah. class. Yeah, I, so I don't remember. <laughs> there's this amazing. It just, just speaking on this, there's this amazing little essay by Jorge Luis Borges called Borges and I. And mm -hmm. I would just, it's its like half a page. So I would recommend if you're listening, it's B-O-R-G-E-S. Yeah, it's B-O-R-G-E-S, Borges and I. And he talks about this, how there's a distinction between I 
and the Borges. And he's like, the Borges is receiving mail. The Borges is doing these things. And then I continue to give myself over to Borges. And he's like, I don't know if it's me or Borges. And there's this really lovely kind of back and forth, this relationship between kind of like the abstract entity that you were just saying, is it Bo Burnham in scare quotes or is it Bo Burnham the I? And there's this really, yeah, it's a really kind of, I think difficult and and kind of fraught terrain that artists and um, and whatnot have always sort of explored. So definitely check that out if people are listening. Okay, we have to wrap up the episode there. Um, we'll get into more of the inside stuff, I'm sure, next week with the mailbag because we did. We got about uh, uh, like almost like a, a, a ten or so emails, all asking similar questions around this the special. So we'll we'll talk Unless a little bit more the about the attack the, the block stands. Just melt the phones, man. Just just <laughs> melt down <laughs> that switchboard. Which is Just fine. Which is more there. than fine. Movies um, so, at Wisecrack. Tell us all about it. That's right. Go ahead. Here, plug plug the email because I didn't plug the email, Michael. Just so people. people I was know. being a company man. I just, I noticed <laughs> where you went, and I was like, "God, be a company man. God, give me an email." <laughs> movies That's at right. Wisecrack co. Everyone, if any of the higher ups are watching, movies at Wisecrack co. Um, but you really nailed the you nailed the phone number though. That was awesome. Let's get out of here. Where can people find you on the internet, Michael? Uh, Michael O. Burns on most social media stuff. Come say hi. And Raymond? Uh, yeah, you can find me on Twitter and Letterboxd. I'm at Crematoria. And uh, since I didn't get to do last week's episode about Inside with these uh, wonderful gentlemen, I wrote a, a slightly more extensive review of it on my Letterbox in case anyone was interested. Ooh, I want to see that. Uh, check it out, man. And if you want, you can check me out on Twitter, Austin underscore Hayden, Insta, AUS underscore H-A-Y. I forget, I got to plug my TikTok too. I got a TikTok. It's Austin dot Hayden. Um, I talk about like philosophy and religion and Christianity. I've had a couple of videos Damn. that have kind of popped pretty hard about my experience as a post evangelical um, that, uh, that a lot of people found that resonated with them. So check that mm-hmm. out if you're kind of struggling in the post Christian world and you're looking for voices. There's actually a really good kind of deconstruction aspect of TikTok. A lot of, a lot of good voices out there giving people, um, you know, kind of like queer pastors and um, a lot of like critical race theory scholars and things like that that are looking at Christianity from uh, through a critical lens. So if that's your vibe, if you need some support, if you're dealing with like a post-Christian landscape thing, come find me and then I can kind of like direct you to other people on TikTok too that are kind of sharing their experiences you could be their um, Moses. You could be their Moses of sorts. On hey, I want to just be their heretical hey, Jesus. Hey, the hey, heretical hey, Jesus. Hey, yeah, hey, that's, that's it. That's it. Um, yeah. Send us out of here, Raymond. Oh, goodbye from a housing block in South London. It's show <laughs> me the Moses. Moses.